Good evening. Good evening. So, after a wonderful cocktail and beef Wellington and all the rest, I think it's time to uh, bring our Hillsdale meeting together. Um, thank you. My name is Gary Brooks, and uh, I'm not really quite sure why I'm the MC today. You go on the radio, and Hugh Hewitt, and Mark Levin, and Rush Limbaugh, and Larry Elder, and my goodness, Laura Ingram, Dennis Prager, they're all talking about this wonderful place called Hillsdale College and its president, Dr. Larry Arn. But uh, I have something they don't have. I'm a graduate of Hillsdale, 1971. So, so I guess that's why I'm up here. So uh, thanks for sharing the evening with me. I'm pleased to welcome you all on behalf of the college and my fellow host committee members. Uh, before we begin, because of today's modern world, if you have a cell phone, as I did the other day, I forgot it was on, and it was embarrassing, so take a moment, we'll wait, and uh, put the Von Bri vibrator off, okay? Would you please? Uh, I thank you. Um, would everybody please join me and stand? We'll give you time. We're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. All right? And, well, there it is, so there we go. And we'll begin, please. I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. As we begin tonight, I'd like to introduce a number of people in the audience tonight. First, I would like to ask my fellow host committee members to stand. They are all listed in the program. They do a lot of work. They bring a lot of good folks out. Would you all stand, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. In addition, which makes us such a warm gathering, we have several alumni uh, and parents with us, in addition to members of our President's Club. Now, our President's Club are individuals who've made a substantial gift to Hillsdale College. And I'm very proud to say at this point we have around 2,300 members of our President's Club. And I'd like to ask all of our alumni, our parents, and President's Club members to stand, please, and be recognized, and thank you. <laughs> Hillsdale College, as in the day when I attended, has 1,300 students from 48 states, seven foreign countries. And of these, we have 55 students uh, from the state of California. I'd like to introduce two admission people for us, Colleen McGinnis and Kyle Merton, where they're right over here. And they're, <laughs> and most important uh, for Colleen and Kyle, they're here to answer questions and will be available later and I had a chance to talk to a nice young lady over here and some more of some uh, prospective students, those who've been accepted uh, to Hillsdale College and those that are looking to uh, apply to Hillsdale College. And so please, uh, you will find these most helpful, wonderful people. Make yourself available as they are to you, okay? We've got a few housekeeping items we usually do before we have uh, our featured speaker, Dr. Larry Arn, speak. First of all, his remarks will be videotaped, and you will have the opportunity to have this sent to you free of charge. So there's the registration table when you came in. Go up there later, and they will be sure to uh, let you have the video of tonight's speech. After the program, I'm going to ask a few people to come to the stage, and they'll have their picture with Dr. Arn. These are our new President's Club's members, Daniel Berger, Charles and Gail Kendall, Jeff and Margie Lewis, and Jeff and Chow Werner. So after, we'll have Dr. Arn's speech and a few question and answer. At the end of that, if you would come up, we will take those pictures as the rest of us go get our dessert and coffee. So you'll be the only ones standing around. We've got some wonderful friends that always surround Hillsdale College, two of them of which Tom Phillips and Tom Fuentes at Regency Books of Eagle Publishing. And they have provided a gift for each of us tonight their book, The uh, Funding Fathers, The Unsung Heroes of the Conservative Movement. Its authors, Nicole Hoplin and, and Ron Robinson. And uh, this book, if you haven't read it, and I hope it's something you can look forward to, highly recommended by Ed 
Mies, and Dinesh Sosha, De Sosha. So it's a tremendous book. Again, it's, it's there for you. Please take a copy and take it with you. Now for tonight's program. Most of you in the room know about Primus, the college's National Speech Digest. Since it was first mailed to 1,000 alumni in 1972, that was the year I became an alumni, there were 1,000 of them sent out. It reprints speeches delivered on campus and at national seminars by such influential people such as Ronald Reagan, Charlton Heston, Margaret Thatcher, Edwin Meese, David McCullough, and many, many more. It now has a circulation approaching 1.9 million, including, <laughs> thank you, including, by the way, this great state of California with 239,000 of those. So despite what you read out of some papers like the Sacramento Bee, we have 239,000 <laughs> of those in Primus. So facts will get in the way of everything else. If you would like any family members and friends to receive this subscription, please again go to the registration desk, fill it out, and they'll be happy to send you in Primus. Those of you who are getting it, and I assume that's about 80 or 90 percent of this group, it's tremendous reading. It comes from the people who have spoken at the college or through outsource events. Tremendous reading, and uh, we encourage you to uh, avail it to others who do not have it, and certainly if you're not on the list, it's very simple uh, to do. All of this literature is free, it's, it's available for you, so please notify uh, the staff. Uh, this year, in keeping uh, team with the uh, communication level of emails, Hillsdale is trying to really upstage their email capability. So they're asking uh, any of you who are not set up for email uh, with the college to again sign up uh, today, and I encourage you to go to the registration table. It's a great way to receive uh, more updates from the college on both uh, national and, and campus issues. So I think we can all appreciate where emails are today, and Hillsdale wants to uh, keep you in, in the program. For those of you that don't know, and I can't imagine who that'd be, uh, Hillsdale's a small liberal arts college located in Michigan. I'm from Michigan. People say, where is Hillsdale College? Well, it's right here. <laughs> That's Mackinac. But you have to be from Michigan to know about your map. Uh, it has an ever-widening reputation. It sets it far apart from its small, humble beginnings in this small little college town. It leads the nations. Besides offering its students a rigorous liberal arts curriculum and privately funded tuition assistance, it is fiercely, fiercely independent. The Hillsdale College Board of Trustees and President Larry Arn have kept the college free from direct and indirect taxpayer subsidies, as well as taxpayer subsidies from the state of Michigan. Hillsdale does not now have any government regulation or control. It does not have to. And the reason it doesn't, because it doesn't take one bloody dime of money. And we ought to all be proud of that. On to Dr. Larry Arn. He is Hillsdale's 12th president over its rich 165-year history. He is not a slouch, let me inform you. He studied and worked in England with Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. And each year, and I've attended one of these classes, he teaches at Hillsdale College. The word waiting in line was established for that class. You can imagine how many students would like to be in that classroom. With the president of such a fine university, he does this every year. Since becoming president of Hillsdale College in the year 2000, he's founded the college's Hoagland Center for Teaching Excellence, a seminar program which is so critically important it brings school government and economic teachers to the school and promotes the principles of the Constitution. In addition, Dr. Arn has initiated the Hillsdale College Distinguished Visiting Fellows Program, which again brings to the campus teachers with such impressive people to interact with as Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Churchill biographer Sir Martin Gilbert, military historian Victor Davis Hanson, Pulitzer Prize winning writer David McCullough, and journalist Mark Stein, to name a few. Just recently, President Arne has established the Alan P. Kirby Center for Constitutional 
Studies and Citizenship, which is located in Washington, D.C. This center coordinates classes and internships for the growing number of students who go to Washington as part of their work in government and journalism. The center works to deepen Americans' knowledge of the principles of limited constitutional government through a variety of programs and publications. Dr. Arn also recently announced that the College Foundation Founders Campaign has been extended. And it's been extended to reach its ambitious and important goals. The major capital and endowment campaign seeks to secure one thing, Hillsdale's independence and excellence in its service to its 1844 mission. In doing so, Hillsdale is serving the foundation of this great country of ours. Many of you who are here tonight have helped in this heroic effort. To date, they have received more than $531 million of cash, pledges, and trust towards the goal of $608 million. In closing, I should also note that Dr. Arn is the author of Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education. This book traces the history of education in America. It explains the crisis of education today. And most important, it outlines how this crisis might be solved. We again have complimentary copies of this book available to you after our dessert and reception. So please uh, stop by and pick one of these up. Hi. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Gary. Good friend. And, uh, Wow, it's a nice crowd. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of old friends here tonight, and uh, there's one that I mention whenever I come back to uh, Southern California in Orange County because he's such an old friend. He's very old now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're so blessed and happy that he's alive. He had a liver transplant a year or so ago, and I figured out what it means uh, because if somebody has an organ changed, it gives you a test, what did the organ do? Anything that stays the same after the organ has been changed was not influenced by the organ. And so I can tell you that uh, being charming and friendly are not a product of the liver. <laughs> being incredibly perceptive about human relations are not caused by the liver. Being anal retentive about <laughs> events. As you think about that term, you wouldn't think it would be caused by the liver, and it is not. That must come from somewhere else. And uh, that man is Tom Fuentes, who's always a pleasure to see. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, so honored tonight um, to have a descendant of a great man. Seems a great man too, himself, here. And uh, in, uh, I'll describe a scene to you. In January of 1863, in Hillsdale College, there was, uh, we were on the frontier. The Civil War was in its flower, such as it was. There were basically no boys on the campus in Hillsdale. There were 500 young men, recent graduates or graduate, or current students who'd taken leave serving in the Union Army. In uh, July of that year, uh, about 100 of them were in the Iron, Iron Brigade at the Battle of Gettysburg and helped to turn the battle, so much so that two of them were chosen to carry Lincoln's casket from, his, from the Springfield Railway Station to his final resting place. It's very manly, very great, very courageous, very honorable. And of course, there were no boys on the campus, and so the people who brought Frederick Douglass to the campus were the Ladies Literary Society. And that was about the only society left on the campus. And we have the handwritten notes of the visit of this very great man. One of the most famous photographs of him was taken uh, on that visit, and we own an original print of the photograph. And uh, I can tell you, we took in, uh, we, we paid Frederick Douglass the amazing sum of $55 
to come and give a speech, which is a lot of money in 1863. And we took in in the gate the minutes of the Literary Society show, 110 bucks. The college will not do that well on me tonight. <laughs> but the great, 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 is that right? How many? Grant, there are three, right? Grandson of Frederick Douglass is here tonight, and his name is Kenny Morris. <laughs> And, if you, you know, there's a lot of famous photographs of Frederick Douglass, and one of them is on his business card. I, I, like, I like the one taken at our campus better. But <laughs> darned if he doesn't look like him. It's amazing. Welcome, sir. Great to have you. And sometime during the course of these remarks, my daughter Katie is going to walk in here, and then she will become, oh, wow. The most important person in the room is not Kenny Morris. <laughs> Although that history is really charming. The most important person in the room tonight, with all due respect to all of the rest of you, is the proof that I married a beautiful woman, one Kathleen Arne. Please stand up. <laughs> Katie is teaching right now her first college class, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's very similar to a class that I'm teaching all afternoon on Monday afternoon. So on Monday, at the same hour, she and I are teaching the Constitution of the United States. And on Monday nights, we talk. And it's, a father never had such an experience. And uh, wherever she's teaching, it's a very elite place. <laughs> she's a better teacher than I am, but the kids are not as good, you know? And, and, and she got this, she, she gave me this report, you know, one of the questions was, you know, what do you do if they're kind of, you know, surly and stuff, you know, and resentful and don't pay attention? And I said, uh, I don't really know, but I'm coming out there. <laughs> she said, uh, no, you're not, but what would you do if you came? And I said, well, I'd throw the people out the window. <laughs> and then the ones left in the room would be the ones who want to be there and uh, that would be a better class. But I think she's conquering them now, and I'm not surprised. Could, you know, isn't she pretty? <laughs> okay, I have just a few points to make, and uh, I, about a quarter of you are here, I think, because you, you wish to enroll in Hillsdale College, and, or your parents are here with you to help you make that decision. And so uh, I'm going to address a few things specifically to you. How many are at a Hillsdale College event for the first time? Uh-huh. Wow. A lot. Thank you for coming. Oh, I see Tom Tate back there. Tom, and Tom Tate is one of my very favorite. He runs an engineering firm here in uh, uh, Southern California. And he's a great guy. And he sends his children to the wrong college. <laughs> USC. <laughs> Good football team. So before I'm done, I have to achieve this. You have to know what the college is and how it might be relevant to the lives we all live today. And if I'm successful, you will know those two things. And uh, I can tell you, you probably don't know either of them now because almost no one knows what a college is today, I'll try to tell you. And I, I, I'm going to feature that because of these students who might show up, because if I don't teach them now before they show up, I might have to throw them out the window. <laughs> I'll mention four things about the college at the start. One of them is it's old, and uh, you have to understand about the way age works among corporate things. You actually live in the oldest country on Earth, and the oldest country in the history of the Earth. And the reason is, uh, the philosopher, as I call him, uh, Aristotle says, if you watch a play, and they have a chorus in the play, and the chorus members don't change, but they come out in their comic chorus, and then they leave and then they come back later and they're a tragic chorus, even though the members are the same, it's not the same chorus. Because organizations are defined by what they are for. 
The United States of America is the clearest possible country in all of human history in stating at the outset what it is for and also the manner by which it will be governed. There's never been anything in all of political history so coherent as that. And as long as we keep that, and right now we are in a great battle to decide whether we will keep that. And do not think for a minute that that battle is lost because it is not lost. And I can also tell you that I will assert to you and I will prove it before I done that it is not going to be lost because we will not have it. It must not be lost. And our college is old in that sense because it was founded in 1844 with a very beautiful document. And that document pledges us to the cause of civil and religious freedom and intelligent piety. The first two being political goods. They are, in fact, specifically America's gift to the world. No people on earth ever enjoyed the blessings of civil and religious freedom before the people of the United States of America enjoyed it. The mother of that girl right over there is from England. And England, the best country in the world before we were born, got those blessings after we did. And that is a simple historical fact. And we, we began with a pledge to support those principles through sound learning. And we never have a board meeting at Hillstock College that we do not begin with a reading from that document. And all there, though there are older colleges than our 166 years, I do not know of any that have no purpose in them except the first purpose by which they were begun. And the first thing all you prospective students must know is that if you are admitted to our college, then you will get a letter from me in June that contains a copy of the Honor Club Code. And the Honor Code quotes from that document. And the letter will say that if, if you come to our college, at station one in the registration process, you will hand in this code. And if you do not, you cannot go to station two. And so do not come unless you yourself are pledged as the board is pledged and as every member of the faculty and the staff are pledged, and as I myself personally am pledged to support the principles of the college. And that makes it the oldest college on the face of the earth. The second thing about the college is it has always had a part in the great affairs of the nation. On the 2nd of July, 1863, a very great general by the name of Buford, a cavalry general, general decided to hold some ground. And he sent so many messages up the road saying, run up here and help me because I'll get killed if you don't. But if you come really fast, we can hold this and we can change the world. And it just so happened the guy who got this message was a guy named Reynolds, who was a very great man himself. And he was killed on that day about 10 minutes after arriving at the battlefield. But he read this thing and he knew who this guy Buford was. And he turned around to his colleagues in the Iron Brigade and he said, we're going to run down that road. We're going to run as fast as we can go. And they got there and by nightfall, two thirds of them were dead. And among the survivors were several from Hillsdale, two of whom won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And those two, it turns out, were, co were chosen to bear Lincoln's casket. And then as now at Hillsdale College, we have no military training of any kind. And yet then as now, we probably have, certainly then, and I think now, more young men and women join the military than any college, pound for pound, size for size in the land. I do have this from a Marine Corps recruiter. Uh, he said that, uh, I've been doing this for six years now and I've got 70 colleges, and you're the smallest. And most of the colleges have not had anybody join the Marine Corps in this years that I've been here, and none has had more than one except you, and you have six this year, and that's typical. Add to that that uh, when the Republican Party, a long time back ago when it, before it became the stupid party, because <laughs> it was actually founded as the brilliant party. I mean, there's never been anything better in all of political history. I assert it. I can prove it. They found a constitutional way to get rid of human slavery. And that meant that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution could be re rejoined as they were meant to be. 
And the first platform convention of the Republican Party was written in Jackson, Michigan by 12 people, and two of them worked at Hillsdale College. One of them was the Civil War governor, and the other was the Civil War lieutenant governor of Michigan. They sent the troops to, to uh, Lincoln, which is why there were so many from Michigan. And they themselves, by the way, had not been trained in anything except the things we train people in today. Because if you come to Hillsdale College, you must know this, that you will spend the first two years studying what everybody else is studying. You will read really old books. And they are hard. <laughs> and they are great. And you will write papers about them. And the professors will place red ink all over the papers. <laughs> An essentially frustrating experience. And it will lay the ground for the rest of your life to know the most important things. And today, like back then, we always thought we should come forward and be of service. And remember, the model of America, and this too is unique in America, nothing before it was ever like this. The model was that ordinary folk in their natural equality and their natural rights would control and contribute to the government. And there would be no born sovereign among us. And in the spirit of that, back when, in 1844, we took these kids who were nobodies and we gave them the education as fancy as the education that Plato himself gave his students because they had the two natural qualifications to which any human being may have. They were willing and they were able. And birth does not matter, nothing matters. I would like to say that my daughter is the brilliant young woman she is because she is my daughter, but alas, human affairs do not work that way. She is just a blessing. Today, what we do is a model of what we did then. We don't take any money from the government. Right now, I'm busy trying to found a private ROTC program because we got so many kids going in the Army and the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force. And we can't take the money from the government for ROTC because they would make us obey their several hundred pages of stupid regulations. So what I've almost close to with the deal with the Marine Corps is they're going to appoint an officer to live somewhere nearby and, they, and our students can report to them and we'll pro provide all the rest of the money. But that is only a microcosm of what every private organization in America has always done when it's been good, which is it has done for its country from its independence and its freedom. And today we do that today. So the country, the college is old. It is faithful. It is moral. We don't have co-ed dorms. And I can tell you when you get there, especially you young men. The girls are really attractive. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> and the last thing about the college that I'll mention is it's a liberal arts college. And uh, I was just talking to Mr. Sabo, who looks like a decathlete. He's back there somewhere, I see him. And uh, he's very energetic and enthusiastic, and he's very open, and he wants to come to our college. And so if you ask him a question, he spits out an answer. And before you can reply to that one, he says the second one, too. And they're both wrong. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it was good, though. I like him. He's going to, this is, as I say, this is a dog that'll hunt. And, uh, and so I got him to, you know, talk about the purpose of life. And uh, I got him to say that happiness was the purpose of life after he tried about six other things. And then uh, I got him to define happiness, and he defined it as financial security. And I raised the question, was anybody uh, rich and miserable? And he said he'd heard of such people. And I said, so it wouldn't just be financial security, would it? And he mentioned health. You know, he's a very good-looking kid, and he's very healthy. He's a very athletic guy. He looks like a decathlete, as I say. And he said, yeah, that, that would be it, too. And I said, anybody healthy and rich who's miserable? And he said, yeah, maybe there were some. And I said, so what would you add? Or put the question another way to put it in political terms. Because this will come up again in a minute when I'm going to talk. Actually, I guess I'm talking now. <laughs> How is the Declaration of Independence written? It's a very extraordinary document. 
because it's a war document. You know the end. All these uh, rich, well-placed, prominent men in a room in Philadelphia that exists still today put their signatures on a document that was an act of treason against the strongest living man. And they mutually pledged to each other their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor. And that's the end of the document. It's incredibly particular. But the beginning of it is simply universal. They had to have a justification for what they did outside their own will. And so they wrote one. They said that uh, sometimes it comes up in human history or when in the course of human events. Not just now, any old time. It becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them to another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle you. And the question before the house in any class at Hillsdale College that's any good is always, what are those laws? How do you know their meaning? And what if somebody disagrees? Is the truth still self-evident if somebody says it isn't so? I'm going to quote Barack Obama about that to you in a minute. Guess what he says. A liberal education is the education that lets you define a meaning to the expression, the laws of nature and of nature's God, or that lets young, ambitious Mr. Sabo back here and all these other kids in, his, in this room who might come to our college to know what is the purpose of their life. Because they're not a mule and they're not a dog and they're not a rooster, they have their purposes. And they're not an angel, they have their purposes. They are human beings. What is the right way, asked Socrates, for a human being to live? As if there is an answer to that question. And liberal education is about that. And I said to Mr. Sable back there, I said, I might teach you to give that answer. And he said, if I come to your college, and I said, yeah, and I, I can promise you something. If you graduate, you will know. And if you don't know, you won't graduate. So those are my four points about the college. That's what we do. My second and penultimate point, I'm tempted to challenge somebody to define penultimate, is um, what is happening in the world and what does it tell us about education and about colleges? I'm going to begin with a story. It's pertinent because it's uh, opposite in time. It happened last week. There was a class in a fancy graduate school in Washington, DC. And in this class was sitting one Stephanie Francel, a student of mine who's now off in a fancy graduate school. And she writes me a thank you letter after this class because the class was horrific to her. The class was taught by a senior official in the Reagan administration, the Reagan administration. They had an exercise in which they were asked to list qualities of leaders. Someone suggested manipulation. And my student replied, but that involves deceit, and that cannot be a good trait for a leader. I'm quoting, by the way, from an email that Stephanie wrote me. The response came when she said this from the teacher, that they were not looking for good leaders, but effective leaders, because Leadership involves certain effects that are common among all leaders, good and bad. And then they talked about this, and uh, somebody said, well, there's Hitler. And the lady actually said, well, you know, Hitler was a very effective leader. And, you know, in one point of view, he was. Because in about 1911, let's say, he was living in the street. He didn't have a place to sleep or a way to take a shower. He smelled really bad, and he looked worse. And he was a street bum. He could only make a living by selling paintings. And uh, they were bad paintings. He was a poor artist. They were tourist paintings. His broker was a Jew, something he always resented and <laughs> took his vengeance. And uh, then, so that's about 1911. And by 1934, he is the ruler 
of what was probably at that moment the greatest power on earth, and it had reorganized Europe, and it was going on a career of conquest that would take it to the gates of Moscow and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, that's effective. But how did it end up? Malone, his country in ruin, himself isolated, shooting himself in a bunker, having watched the death seconds before of the only woman he could ever say that he loved, and he treated her like a tool all his life as he did everything else around him. In other words, he died in the condition of misery and squalor to which he was entitled by his every deed. And my student Stephanie is a little impatient that the distinction between a leader and a tyrant is not the distinction that they are after. In the book that made me a student, I was going to be a lawyer. Um, I had to take this course in college, and it was on Plato's Republic. And in the first book of Plato's Republic, there's this discussion. And it's one of the most magical things ever written, one of the most meaningful, one of the most significant, one of the most eternally meaningful discussions. All of you young people should decide whether you come to Hillsdale College on the basis of whether you want to know the answer, the answer to the question that I'm about to ask. Because this sophist guy, whose uh, job is to teach ambitious young people how to be powerful, and they pay him money for that. And uh, he, his argument in the first book of Plato's Republic is that justice is the interest of the strongest person, whoever that is. And Socrates refutes him by saying, well, good, OK. So let's say you're the strongest. Then what should you do? What is your interest? What will you do with your power? In other words, it's a very simple point. Power only raises the question, what will you do with it? You see, and we all have to answer that question all the time. And Socrates banishes this guy, and he's very angry. He's a jerk. And also his livelihood is threatened, because Socrates doesn't charge money. And so then this young man, this bold young man, says, uh, Glaucon is his name, show me then, Socrates, that justice is the right thing, even if by practicing it, you win the reputation for injustice and that seemed to me when I first heard that, that was in the year 1974, in about March. And I can remember the color of the walls in the room. It was so dramatic. And I thought to myself, I want to know the answer to that question. I want to know what I asked Mr. Sabo. What is the thing that you can do that can make you fully human and can make your life worth living, no matter what the cost you might have to pay for it? What is the thing that you would say to your daughter she must do, regardless of the cost, because then her life will be meaningful and right? And I'm saying that my student, Stephanie, is offended because that is the question that is excluded in this college today, a famous college about two miles from the White House. Anita Dunn, the White House Communications Director, I'll make this a nonpartisan point, because I've said this first person, the teacher in the class, is a Reagan administration official. And since I said the name Anita Dunn, I will say the name Constance Newman, who is the Director of White House Personnel Management in the Reagan administration. She's the teacher in the class. Anita Dunn is the White House Communications Director, and she says, to a bunch of school children the other day, you know, because when you get to be in the White House, you're like really wise and you can talk to the young and preach at them and tell them what to do. The third lesson, she says, and tip, actually come from two of my favorite political philosophers, Mao Tse-sung and Mother Teresa. In 1947, when Mao was being challenged within his own party on his plan to basically take China over, the nationalist Chinese held the cities, they had the army, they had the Air Force, they had everything on their side. How can you win, said people to poor little Mao? You know, aspiring ruler, little Mao in his britches and his hopes, right? How can you do this against all the odds against you? And he said, you fight your war and I'll fight mine. That's her point, right? 
And pressed upon this later, she said, you know, maybe he didn't do everything right, but he lived his dream. And there's an argument among historians. Did he kill 40 or did he kill 70 million? And by the way, a variability of 30 million, that's a big variation. That means you've got to really kill a lot of people for the uncertainty level to be that high. So you see the point? Something has happened in this country correlate two developments. In the one development, the government does not operate at all the way it used to be. There is this constitution written. It is simply the best thing like it ever done. And that is without any controversy. Nothing has lasted so long or done so well. And, and we don't act like it says what it says, you see. It's a simple document. You can read it in 20 minutes. And it does not have the bearing it used to have. That's one development. I'm going to write a book if I can this summer. I think I can. Because the idea came to me walking around Washington, DC. And in the book, I'm going to say that there are these beautiful buildings in Washington, DC. And there are these ugly buildings in Washington, DC. And all of the ugly buildings were built recently. And all of the beautiful buildings were built a long time ago. And everything that goes on in the beautiful buildings is justified by the Constitution of the United States. And everything that goes on in the ugly buildings is not. By the way, do you ever look at the Department of Education? Do you know what it looks like? I'm going to put pictures. I'm going to put fancy pictures. I'm going to send my boy off to Washington to take a lot of pictures. He likes to take pictures. And, and if you look at the Capitol, what's the first thing you notice about the Capitol? The shapes are round at the Capitol. The circle is the perfect shape. The second thing, it points up, right? Do you know what the uh, Department of Education building looks like? Do you know where the word bureaucracy comes from? It comes from a desk with lots of slots to put stuff in. It looks like such a desk standing up there. And what's in the slots is people, bureaucrats. People occupy the slots. Did you ever go around the California Capitol building? Go sometime with my friend Tom McClintock. He's in Congress now, thank God for it. But when he was in Sacramento, and, and he gets back there sometimes, his, his district, is up that way now. He's a carpetbagger. <laughs> He's just a really great congressman. I mean, really great. He's awesome. And uh, he took me on a tour one time. And the old Capitol building, there are not very many offices, and they have an enormous dignity. See? But if you're in the, a bureaucrat in the Department of Education, you've got your slot. And the slot is not really a human thing to have. The architectural method of constitutional reform. And I'm saying that change is enormous. And just as the Constitution and its structure are, prove, are, are argued for as a institutional representation of the meaning of the Declaration of Independence in the Federalist Papers, so the new kind of government has a new idea behind it. And it's not the same as the idea of the Declaration of Independence. And that means, before I prove that, that we are in a fight for the central core of our country. And if the fight goes the wrong way, we will be reduced to the simple material that is the doctrine of modern government that, in fact, we are. And so I'm saying that these developments are not accidental. They're not just some gradual step-by-step -step development. The kind of government we have today is being chosen, even, by the way, against the public wishes, made more urgent because the public does not wish it, because a new principle justifies the new thing. And so do you see what happens? There's an argument going on about the meaning of man and the meaning of government and our freedom 
and our civilization depend upon the outcome of that argument. And I believe that is as simple as one, two, three. And that means, by the way, it follows, and it cannot be resisted that it follows, that nothing is so urgent as to understand the terms of that argument. And I will tell you that the politicians who resist the trend of things to the day, for the most part, do not understand the argument. Most of the ones who are pushing the trend very much do, but their opponents are confused. Why, for example, has the Congress never passed the Equal Opportunity Act? Do you know what it is? It's the California Civil Rights Initiative at the federal level. And did you know that there have been eight years, I think, of Republican control of both houses of Congress and the presidency, and they have never passed that act? And every time it is put on the ballot, in Michigan, for God's sake, Ward Connerly is a friend of mine. I uh, was the chairman of the California Civil Rights Initiative before he was. One of the greatest uh, acts of persuasion I ever committed in my life was to persuade him to take my job. <laughs> and he said to me, you know what he said? I'll say this because the descendant of Fred Douglas is here tonight. It's a good thing to say in front of him. He looked at me across the table one day and he said, you think this is easier for me than it is for you? And I said, I don't know what I think about that, Ward. I said, I think you'll be better at it than I will. And he said, why? Because I'm black? And I said, that's part of it. But the real reason, I said, is uh, somebody should run this thing who wants to be the governor of California. And I don't. I have too good a job for that. And I can teach, you know. I should teach people. That's not what I should do. You should do this. And he said, but I'll do it, he said, I think. But he said, you have to know it's harder for me. Because he said, if I do it, I'm betraying something. It's what they expect from you. And I, you know, one time I took a red eye with him to Washington, D.C. to get up early in the morning. We, we, we flew through Chicago, so he couldn't sleep on the plane. And uh, we took a red eye, and we went to ask a bunch of congressmen to endorse us, and they didn't. It was a vain effort. They should have. To one of them, I held up, uh, while he was, uh, we were in the conference, he passed out some articles he wrote. And one of them had the name of Abraham Lincoln in the title. And he was talking on blah, 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 about why he wouldn't endorse it. And I held up that article. And he finally got distracted, and he said, what, what? And I said, did you write this article? And he said, uh, I did. And I said, name a Lincoln here in the title. He said, yeah. I said, what were you saying again? He said, it's not as simple as that. I said, you know, you never heard Lincoln say that. Why won't they pass that? Why has the government grown in places where it's got no business being under administrations of both types? And I will argue that it's not because the people in Congress are, are craven, really, in either party. It's that one party has a new principle of justice it espouses, and another party is confused. And they can't meet head on the, the, the claim that limited government is not the right way to go. And that means they can't make the argument against the incredible growth of the entitlement state. And so their arguments are mostly about efficiency. I, you know, when Obama spoke in Baltimore to the Republicans, I was out there. I spoke after him. I was better. <laughs> it's, it's not a high standard. I mean that. It isn't. I'm going to explain it in a minute, right? But what was it like? There's about 20 or 30 of them. And wow, they're good. They have the gift. I, I turn back to you young people. Do you know what it takes to learn? I can't teach you. You have to learn. And you have to be humble and assertive at the same time. You have to dare to want to know the very best things. And you have to possess your soul in complete discipline and patience to attend to those things. Can you sit down, I ask a kid tonight, and study hard for three hours without getting up and giving it your whole attention? And he said, I can. And I said, good, I'll find out the truth of that. 
Because there's two kinds. You can do that or you don't get through. Because that's what it takes, right? You have to have self-control of a wonderful kind to be a great student. And learning to be a student is to practice doing that. And it's hard. It's just really great. And at our college, by the way, don't get the idea we beat you up. We don't. I mean, we do a little bit. But I mean, we kind of do. But the real point is this. These standards that I'm talking about, we don't make them. They're there. We just try to help you meet them. And you'll get nothing but encouragement from us. And also probably B's and C's. But that's because the standards are high. We didn't make them. And, and that means, by the way, if you ever study the great moments in American history, the ones that went well, you will always find some divinely gifted soul who had all the virtues and they could put things in their simplicity and their fundamental meaning and they staked their lives on that. So Thomas Jefferson, rich farmer, and George Washington, rich farmer, signed that paper and they knew what it meant when they did. And Jefferson had the eloquence to write the paper. And, J and James Madison had the wisdom to write the other paper, the Constitution. And George Washington had the courage in his soul to put the army in the field and defend the papers. And I'm saying that those are the only political virtues that matter in a crisis. And those virtues depend upon a kind of learning. We will make the argument truly and beautifully and we will stake our lives on it or we will lose because that is how it has always been. That means that the standards of greatness that are set by Lincoln and Washington are the necessary standards for the crisis today and we have no purpose except to strive to emulate those standards and know if we have striven with all our hearts that it will not matter win or lose because we will have lived well. At the Battle of Trenton, when they're going across the Delaware River, because they're going to attack the Hessians on Christmas night, hoping they'll be drunk, because they can't beat them if they're not drunk. Right? And they got to beat them, because there isn't any more time. And the Glover says to Washington, we're late, General. We're going to get there after dawn. And you said we couldn't beat them unless we got them before dawn. Are we going to turn back? And Washington said, no, we're going to go on. And Glover, who was a very brave man, said, how can that be? And he said, look, either way, we're going to be dead in a week if we don't win this battle. We're going to go on down the road, and we're going to win in the face of the enemy. All his riches, all his fame, everything about it, they meant nothing to him. Because the only thing that meant anything to him was that he would not be ruled by any man claiming to be born to rule him because of who his father was or any other principle except his own consent and he would rather die in the cause of defending that even ignominiously, even having no way, name or fame than to live well under the patronage of another. And we would not have our country today except for the clear sight that defined such things so awesomely with such blistering clarity, you can hardly bear to look at it. It's like trying to stare at the sun and then the courage to back it up. And don't make a mistake about what's going on. We are building a nomenclatura among us right now. Do you know what that word means? It's from the Soviet days. It's the Russian word for a list of names. And the nomenclatura were a specialized class of people with a lot of power. And, and the name is a derisory name because the principle of communism is you don't get to have a name. Did you ever read Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kersler? Did you ever read 1984 by George Orwell? The point is communism requires to extinguish humanity. 
And what happened was, by the way, in this high principled militant phil philosopher revolution, what they ended up with was a bunch of corrupt officials. We started our recession that we're having right now where unemployment rates are probably north of 15% in September of 2008. Do you know how many people in the United States Department of Transportation made more than 170 grand in August of 2008? Do you know how many do today? 1,692. The plan is, the principle is easy to state. This is in the words of Woodrow Wilson. I can show you where he wrote this in just these many words. It's not, it's not an elaboration. It's not anything. It's, it's what he said. It's what he wrote. And he's an academic. He's responsible for what he writes. He said, the Declaration of Independence is obsolete. We now know that human societies must be living and changing things. They were accountable to Newton and later, and now we know about Darwin. But you see, because we know that everything is change, what was the campaign slogan? The opportunity arises for us to manage the change, and we can be in control of everything. We can appoint a class of highly trained people, and they can manage the society. Where are the gains in the health care bill? Under the old system, here's where they were. I'm the son of a school teacher in Pocahontas, Arkansas. He, he grew up in a place where nobody ever went to college. He went, right? If I'd been interested in biology and stuff like that, I probably would end up being a medical doctor, as I almost ended up being a lawyer. And why? Because my dad had gone to college and been a school teacher, and I could have been mis unfortunate. I could have been born to some rich guy. I was born to a guy who liked to read books, and, he, and I had to work. I didn't have any money. What fortune I had. And so things like that is how you become a doctor, see? And I've already told you, I have learned from being a teacher that I'm pretty good at my job, and I know stuff, and I know stuff because I love the stuff, and it's, you know, I can talk about it. I practiced. It moves me deeply. But I have found in the classroom that I do not teach them, they learn. And so I have to organize everything with my colleagues so that they show up ready to go. I teach Monday afternoon from 2 to 4.30. What a dreary exercise. <laughs> and once in a while, you know, I'll say to them, wow, are we not ready to do this today? I can prove it to you. The philosopher teaches that this is the highest thing of which a human being is capable. And you've shown up today and you're sleepy? Really? Can that be? I got Girl Scout cookies if you want them. But we got work to do. Get up! Huh? And they do. I tell you, they just sit up, you know, and they're just ready to go. See? That's how you make a doctor. That's how you make a lawyer. And then after you make one, then some free person has some kids and they, they have a wife and a husband, and they take care of themselves, and they go to the doctor. Free people cooperating and building their lives. To, that's how you make a health care system. And the plan today, released last week, is that there will be a national board to set rates and methods of service by some experts who make 170 grand in the Department of Education, the Republican Secretary of Education says, we started out as a little small office just gathering data, and now we're 5,500 strong with our computers and our Blackberries. And I'll tell you what every single one of the 5,500 has in common. There's not a teacher in the crowd. And what they do is they make their 170 grand and they don't build any roads and they don't teach any students. They sit around and talk about a distant thing and try to organize it by rules from above. And they think that that is the key to all progress in human society. And if they get their way, they will become numerous enough that it won't matter how the rest of them vote. 
and you could lose control of your government over that. And you must not let that happen. And so I will close with these points. If you think how the Declaration of Independence is written, you will see that today, well, I'll read it to you. It's a quote. Implicit in the Constitution structure, this is written by a man who took an oath to uphold the Constitution as a condition of high public service. Implicit in the Constitution structure, in the very idea of ordered liberty, was a rejection of absolute truth. The infallibility of any idea, any tyrannical consistency that might lock future generations into a single unalterable course. Audacity of hope, Barack Obama who took an oath to uphold the Constitution. In the nature of this country, public opinion is sovereign until it uses, loses its constitutional forms. Public opinion is in pretty good shape as things go. The purpose of the movement is to make public opinion no longer sovereign, but to elevate expert opinion, not in the name of despotism, but in the name of a kind of perfection designed by human beings. That is the movement that is in control of the government. There is an insufficient resistance to that, but already in power, there are people who have the minds of students and statesmen, and they know enough, and they should be supported. The single thing that must be added to the situation today is a standard of statesmanship built upon a kind of learning that will uphold the laws of nature and of nature's God and make the Constitution of the United States function again as it is supposed to do. And so I just named two components, and one of those components is supplied by teaching and learning. And guess what I do for a living? Hillsdale College in its history has come forth to help the country at peril to itself, and today, I promise you, there is no danger it will not run to serve the principles upon which it was born. And I thank you for your interest and your help. It's uh, an honor to uh, allow some time for some questions. We have time for one or two questions, and uh, I really encourage you to take advantage of uh, the brilliance and uh, the thoughts in this room. So do we have a, a question out there? Uh, please raise your Yes, sir. I've heard Dr. pleasure over the past 10 years, and this is one of the best, no, seriously, this is one of the best uh, instructions I've had in the past five years what's happening to us politically. And this is sort of a question. Do you think, Dr. Arn, that the American people, in their current state of ignorance and diseducation by the teachers in the public sector, can rise to the fore and do what we did in 1776? Thank you. I, I do, yeah. I do. 
the an short answer is yes, Carl, and thank you. Uh, the longer answer is not very long. Um, what they teach in colleges today is hard to learn. Because like they teach that, I mean, what, you know, by the way, since 3,000 years, the, the chief political question is, what is the nature of good versus evil rule? And they actually teaching, by the way, it's kind of a bipartisan effort. Um, and you know, the stupid party is, in my opinion, you know, I'm a member of the stupid party and I support it very strongly and think it better, but it's gotta get smart. So the, po the point is, what they teach in colleges, thank God most people don't learn it very well. Because, <laughs> and you know, most people get out of college and, and what do they do? They get married and they get a family and they get a job and they might start a business and they go to church and they have life experience. And life experience is pretty close to nature. So what I think is it's not an accident that this is a problem of elite opinion in the main. And I do think that we need, so first of all, I think the people are reliable and I think if they become unreliable, we're finished. Um, so, and, and you know, I studied Winston Churchill for a long time. I met Katie's mother over there doing that. And, uh, and what did you learn from that? It, it looked dark, right? But trust, because they do have the right to govern themselves. And it's not for us to take that away from them. What do you need to add? First of all, you know, right after the election, because we, we have this center in Washington now. I bought a building, we the college, I mean, I did it, I guess, but the college bought this really cool building right on Capitol Hill, and we're gonna open it on September 17th, Constitution Day this year, have a big gala celebration. And we got 100 kids a year going there now to study, and we got 60 congressional staffers and stuff studying the Constitution with us, and some partners, Heritage, and some others. And we got a bunch of congressmen, who are friends of mine, mostly, they're, they're all friends of Tom Tate and Tom Fuentes, almost all of them that I know. And you know, the really good ones are really great. And so what I think is what a value added is, is teach them, because we're gonna have to, you know, let's put the point straight. We're gonna have to, to first limit and then gradually dismantle the entitlement state. And we're never gonna get that done unless we have a principle of justice to, to justify it. Something that we stand up and say, we won't do that, that's not right. This is the right thing. Nobody ever imagined in the American Revolution the stuff that goes on today. It has to be spewed out of our mouths and we have to persuade people that their instinct is correct. So I think that the problem is not among the great many. And you know, look, there's 400 of you guys here tonight and we send a, mail, a, a newsletter out to, because you know, think of my experience. The Department of Education budget has gone up 33% in the current budget just submitted. And I actually think, given what they do with the money, it would be better if they piled it up in a parking lot and burned it. And, and that's money to my competitors. Thank God they're so wasteful. How would I ever keep up? But what we have is you guys. And nobody ever makes, you know, I haven't asked you for any money tonight. I'm not gonna. If you wanna give, you'll give and you'll find a way. Just like going to med school, just like everything. You'll take care of yourselves, right? And if you think we'll help you do that, serve the causes you love. So that's a very, and I live on that. In, in October of 2008, what did I think? Right, the capital markets are going down. Obama's talking about a, a cap on the deductibility of charitable contributions and free tuition for every kid in America to college. Those are my three revenue streams, <laughs> right? And what, what have we done, you know? Told them to stick it, again. <laughs> so what I think is I have the vindication of that experience. We're here, so I, Carl, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about the people, and I'm meaning for us to get optimistic about their leaders, but we got some work to do there. Back, yes, sir. Uh, in the back row. Well, 
Well, we're unique. Yeah, we're pretty good. Um, and I, you know what? What? What's? What's? First of all, you can't work in a college without having a fair amount of humility. There's a lot of problems, you know. But come visit. Hundreds do every year. And what you'll find out is, the people show up ready to work. My my competitors, like one of my near competitors in the Midwest, just announced that they're cutting eight percent of their faculty for failures of admissions, failures of student body enrollment. And you know, every time they get a kid, they get a bunch of money from the government coming with them, even though they're a private liberal arts college. Our applications this year are up 20%. And they're already high. They've been going up 8 and 10% a year, but now they've gone up 20%. So a lot of things are right about our college. And I, I, I first of all, don't think it takes so many as that. But second, we've been very successful, and we get emulators now. And God bless them. I hope they really do what they say. Um, so, and, and, and I don't want you to think it's a numbers game, because see, what Carl said, and I think, sir, implicit in your question, is a thing that I actually think is a misunderstanding. Like, here's just a fact, right? The public education system is bad. It's been bad for a long time. That's fact one. Fact two, the current president of the United States has the lowest approval ratings of any president since after a year since they've been taking polls. Now, is that a problem with public opinion? I don't think so. I think that I, I, I think that we need a certain kind of learning to become sovereign first among a few people. And you know, how many Hillsdale College graduates are here tonight? You know, there's some. And the old ones, you know, it wasn't it hard back then, but, but they, it was hard. <laughs> Sorry, I have to do that. And the young ones, you know, like I got a kid, and, and you know, how many people led the American Revolution? And I'm not saying the ones who lead our country are all going to come from Hillsdale College. They won't. It's just that the number is going to be finite, and we're going to be talking to them. And we can help. And, and, Remember this too, I, I should say this because it's a very important point of humility. There are two kinds of really great teachers. Uh, one kind we can make, real smart, got the light in their eye, can't talk any ambitious subject without them sitting up and getting going, and they're going to do a lot. And then there's Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill and George Washington. God makes them, I don't. They're just a special gift. And so part of, part of the curious thing about great affairs in the life of nations is you get that or you don't. In fact, in some of the great old philosophic books, that level of political ability is treated as a synonym for chance. So first of all, about your question, I don't think it's a numbers game. I think a good college can do a lot, and there's a few pretty good ones. And we're pretty prominent. And so we're going to make a difference, and if we win, over time, then there's no reason at all why the education system can't gradually become very solid everywhere. It took it about 100 years to go rotten. You know, and, and you know, rotten is not the natural tendency. So maybe it'll take 50 or 60 years for it to get better if we can win some battles. So I guess that's my thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that guy over there. Yes, sir. Dr. Arn, I'm Raghu Mathur, Chancellor of uh, local South Orange County Community College District. Oh, yeah, you're part of that mafia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Fuentes, probably That's still, right. huh? <laughs> he's, a, he's a distinguished, uh, Mr. Fuentes is a distinguished member of our Board of Trustees, and we really, we really love and revere him there. My question is, Hillsdale College is no question a great college, what are we going to do about the public education system across America? You mentioned that there are a lot of challenges, and they can become great, maybe in 60 or 70 years. But what do they need to do now so that they could become great well, in 60 or 70 years? I'll repeat and embellish. First of all, you can't fix it all now. It can't be done, right? Because the, the, there, you know, here, here's what makes, here's what you get. You just have to get one thing right. 
to, I can tell you, you just have to get one thing right to make a college really successful. Everything. <laughs> they, and I, I, I just can't tell you how much I mean that. They got a, you know, when I got there at Hillsdale, I, I, one, of, one of the best things I do is I eat with the students in the dining hall a lot. And my predecessor didn't very much, and he was good. I'm not criticizing him, but what I found out was about 20% of the students were really mad at us. And I couldn't figure why they were mad. And they were mad because we had a lot of rules, and they weren't their rules. That's why we have an honor code. That's why I said all that stuff to you guys. Because remember, you sign that document, you're stuck. I had a boy. We had a really good football team this year. There was a boy on the football team, and he was misbehaving. And it was, it's rare, I, I almost never have a discipline meeting with a student. But this kid was kind of tough on the dean of women and the dean of men. And I heard what he said to them and I got really angry and I dragged him in there. And I, you know, I had his, from five years ago, I had his honor code. And I sat him down and I said, did you sign that document? Is that you? And he said, yes sir. I said, huh, wow, read that to me. And he reads it and I said, you, you signed that. He said, yeah, and then I got his fraternity pledge. And I said, you, you took that pledge, did you? He said, yeah, I said, read it. And he read it, and I said, the highlighted sentence, read it again. Honor to women upon all occasions. He said a foul word in front of my dean of women. I said, did you say a foul word in front of my dean of women? And he got small, he's a big old boy, you know. And I said, and you, and you took that oath? Shame. I said, you know why I don't throw you out that window? It's not because you're big. I can. I'm so angry, but I can do so much worse to you. And, and remember, you don't have any cause to complain because you swore your own oath. The word college means partnership. You all got to sign up. You can make it great if you do it together. Now the point is, you're not going to fix the public schools quick if that's what it takes to fix them. Make options. I got a deal to offer you. If you will form a charter school and get it through so that it can be well run, we will supply you and pay a headmaster for seven years and we will supply you a curriculum and we will train the faculty. And that will cost us about a hundred grand a year and we have the money. And we're gonna start doing that all over the country. <laughs> so, as I say, it's not a numbers game, but there's some numbers. And, and we should probably go eat dessert now and you guys are great. Bless you all. Thank you.